thank you very much for joining us. How are you? I'm very, very nervous. Very, very nervous because I've been listening to your podcast, you two, and oh. this honesty thing, I'm really worried <laughs> about this honesty thing because we have all learned, haven't we, in recent years, particularly with the advent of social media, to lie our tits off. Yes, that is true. There, there that, is that is true. There is that. And without appearing to be kind of sycophantic, can we thank you for all the retweets and the social media stuff that you have been very kind to do on our behalf without having to be asked, I would like to point out uh, to the punters. My pleasure. But, my pleasure. But the thing is, Kay, you say that you're a wee bit scared, a wee bit intrepid of this. The people you deal with on a daily basis yeah, yeah. who are phoning in, I mean, they're not, <laughs> they're not exactly cuddly or light and frothy some of them <laughs> would that be right well we would get a broad range of um popular society i mm -hmm. think we could say i mean i don't know people always say to me sort of any situation not just the phone in you know what do you do when people are sort of agitated or fiery or angry mm -hmm. um but you probably know this too that any interviewer's nightmare or broadcaster's nightmare is people who don't see anything yeah yeah i mean the, the amount of times that i've done um, live chat shows and whatever and people are like so what what is it actually we're doing it's a chat show all oh, right so what do you want me to do chat yeah. um could you chat about your career that's the reason you've been booked all oh, right what do you want me to say about it anything please actually could you just get out i've had enough now i've cancelled <laughs> the show um, but it's very bizarre because i always think when i watch question time because i like a bit of self-harm i like a bit of sadomasochism <laughs> and you can see the people particularly in scotland and they get really excited and the chin starts going and then they say their thing yeah. really quiet. Ah, 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 and, ah, and you're like, oh, you've kind of you've ruined that. But you know, it's a funny thing, that, because, you know, I'm pretty relaxed now about asking questions because I suppose I've done it for an awful long time. But if I'm ever in a situation, it doesn't happen that often, but, you know, I'm in an audience of something. I don't know, maybe something at the Edinburgh Festival. Do you remember that? It was a little sort of... Yeah, thing get together. In Edinburgh. Do you remember it, that? Yeah, it was a kind of buffet and mingle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Anyway, <laughs> um, and you know it's like a question and answer situation and so i'm sitting there thinking i'd like to ask a question i'd like to ask a question i get very very nervous and and i do get the kind of fluttery lip but and the kind of dry mouth and all the rest of it do you think that's because of the profile that you have that you don't want to be seen to be i'm like some celebrity oh hi hi i'm in the room i'm in the room and i'm gonna ask a question Do, does your profile are you kind of hoist by the petard of your own profile then no I, I genuinely don't think that it is i think okay. absolutely in that moment i'm just the same as anybody else that when the spotlight comes on to mm. you you feel all of these eyes come to you and is this going to be a really stupid question because like you go back to the question time type scenario mm. Um, the person who asked like a really stupid question, there is like a collective eye roll with everyone else <laughs> yes. in the room and that kind of, oh my God, you know, and, you know, nobody likes that. That's not a nice situation. So are you going to be that person that's going to get the collective eye roll? Mm. I, I think that's what it is. I wondered one if there was an eye roll when, I mean, it still haunts me that I had what could only be described as a mental breakdown live on your radio show. <laughs> Oh, do you know? Do you remember what you that? Uh, well, yeah, you do, but I certainly wouldn't describe it in those terms. And you know, I'm not going to suddenly go into sycophantic mode. I, I mean this so genuinely. I was so grateful to you for speaking just so honestly and so sincerely because I was kind of joking a little bit at the beginning. You know, we've all learned to sort of lie our tits off. Yeah. I I think actually we have developed. Uh, uh, just an automatic this is what we say in public yeah and this is what we say in private to to friends and family and trusted people and so when you were very honest about you know that the havoc that covid had wrought in your life mm. um i genuinely felt you know honored am i going too far but that, that you were able to be honest and that you were able to trust the situation and so i was grateful for that um, yes, because it certainly wasn't planned, but I did. I got very emotional, which I found was kind of I couldn't help myself. Tried to gather myself, um, but oh. it was, of course, it was COVID related. Keep your hands off that button. Oh, every oh, time, yes. every time. But we spoke about it after the fact, and yeah. you did have quite a significant interaction with someone that huge got in touch amount, with you. Yeah, um, there was a huge amount of people uh, who were in agreement with me that that spoke to me. Um, but there was someone in particular who wrote me an absolutely vile email of how dare I speak to a member of the medical profession that way. And, um, you know, that's a whole sort of, you know, you should 
be you know respectful to authority and and I couldn't help it but I just I emailed him back very calmly mm -hmm. and succinctly but basically laid out every reason why you know because he was basically saying oh you're a comedian what does it matter and people are dying and I kind of just basically gave him in bullet points my life story to date and he came back and apologized profusely not realizing that I'd what had did? such yeah that I'd had such a sort of um varied varied and interesting life uh -huh. that hadn't always been straightforward and plain sailing and so it is interesting if you do take somebody to task on yeah. well it wasn't oh it wasn't over twitter it was privately uh -huh. through an email but because people don't they don't know what's happened in your past or what's happened in your life but Kay, do you find that with your interactions with people on social media they always seem to i remember actually um, you'd said something and I'd replied and this woman was clearly a big fan of yours and she went, don't talk to her like that! And I went, oh, you sycophantic little twit, stop your nonsense and go and have a cup of tea, you know, pipe down. And then she was like, oh, I've reread that, I understand what you were saying. And it was just nonsense. But do you think that people, they either hear you on the radio or they see you on the television and they think, right, I've got the measure of her, I know what she's like, professionally, uh, personally, politically and all that kind of stuff, and then they just come at you? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it does happen all the time. And, you know, it is hurtful. You know, we, we've mm -hmm. all, you know, we know the score. We know just block it, just ignore it, just do that. But, you know, we're all human beings at the bottom of it. Yep. And we all like to think of ourselves, I'm sure. Even Mr. Putin probably likes to think of himself as a nice person. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you get people coming at you and making all sorts of com comments that, you know, aren't really about what their original disagreement was, but they just go low, they just go personal. You're a bitch, you're a witch, you're stupid, you're ugly, you know, I mean, just personal insult. Um, you'd have to be made of stone, really, mm -hmm. for that not to to hurt. And and it and it does hurt, but we seem to I mean it's funny, my uh, eldest daughter is in her second year at Edinburgh University. As you can imagine, it's not had the most fun time. Mm. She's doing economics and politics as it happens. Coincidentally, <laughs> I did the same degree at Edinburgh. You know, and I have these rosy memories of sitting around a group of people discussing ideas, exchanging ideas, not always seeking to agree, mm. you know, and not always agreeing, but you know, oh that's interesting. Why do you think this? And why do you think that? Oh, I never thought of this, all of that kind of conversation. Whereas now we seem to be reduced to winning and losing. But it's exactly yeah. that. And that's what the, the way that that comes out of is political debate. So, sort of, well, who came out the best? And you're like, there are much bigger problems than how a PR professional has seen, you know, a leader here or a leader in England or Ireland or, or whatever. The thing that really sticks in my head is there is no, we've talked about this before on here, there's no respect for political difference and there is no respect for difference of opinion because people, it's fair enough for someone to go, Bruce, you're not funny, you know, I really can't stand you, blah, 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 blah. I would say, switch off. Then they go in and go in. I mean, it happens very rarely, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, this is hypothetical. But yeah, it is the fact that... Doing that, will you? It's, not nice. it's just outrageous. But they want, <laughs> they, they want a head on a stick. They want, you know, it's almost they want you to concede. They want you to crumble. They want to see you cry. Like some people, as, you know, me and um, my friend Sue always say, you know, the internet is the playground for the unhinged. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Do you do you go looking? Do do you just sort of catch Twitter? Obviously, you go on Twitter and you see that people have replied or whatever. But do you ever do the? Do you go looking <sighs> to see if people have search a name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, no. Why do you? Me? Yeah, I do. do Why? You, it depends on your mood. Depends on your mood. Sometimes you just feel, you know, I, I'm in a really strong position. You just, you know, you're the cock of the walk, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the problem is I think it's when you are feeling vulnerable that you are most likely to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you really go down the, the, rabbit the hole, hole because yeah. you are vulnerable. You see stuff that's very critical and hurtful inevitably because it's there, which makes you feel even shittier. And, you know, you're, then you're in free fall. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm great on Twitter when I'm feeling good about myself. And, and I'll be honest, you know, sometimes I see, you know, real Zoomers <laughs> and they make a comment and I think, right, I can... I can use that and throw it back at you and make you look stupid, which actually doesn't reflect well on me no. because I've taken advantage of that and I shouldn't. I should just stand back, but I don't because I'm feeling good about myself. I'm feeling a bit smart arsed and, you know, I throw a comment that brings them down. I'm actually just contributing to the horrors of it, aren't I? You know, but when I'm feeling vulnerable, that very same comment 
would have me literally on the floor. Oh, but I'm actually really nice and I do work for charity and I'm nice to my children. And, you know, I'm just a pathetic wretch. Yeah, it is weird. Oh, isn't I've it? met so many of those. They're all dead to me. What, pathetic rich? <laughs> oh, witches, they're so witches. needy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have that, though. Oh, yeah, just... no, totally. But it's, it's like the thing being a performer, Kay, that you can go through a month at the Edinburgh Festival that you talked about, which I'm not sure what it is. And, oh. um, you know, you'll do your run and you'll get four star reviews. You know, the classic thing is a comedian comes in the backstage going, oh, I got a three and it reads as a four. And that's them for the rest of the run. Mm-hmm. And you can go a bit anywhere between. Between, you know good threes good fours good fives you'll get a one star you'll focus on the one star mm-hmm. yeah that that is that is human nature yeah but without being overly zen about it because that's not really my nature <laughs> we're missing out on growth you know when we're all sort of taking pot shots at each other we just knock little bits off each other don't we all become diminished yeah Whereas, for instance I, I won't say what it was i don't want to date your podcast but we had a discussion on the radio today mm-hmm. and in my head on the phone and i went in with a particular point of view um of what i thought now you know obviously i do the phone in i want to hear all different kind of views mm-hmm. but my own personal view was x mm-hmm. by the end of the phone in it had moved to y oh, really? because you know a couple of people came in with really strong points, really strong perspectives that I hadn't thought of. And by the end of it, I thought, you know what? You have shifted me. You have made me see something mm-hmm. that I didn't see. Now, that feels great to me. Yeah. Now, I was wrong in my own head. You know, I, I now think, well, I had a mistaken view at nine o'clock and I had a better view at 10 o'clock, thanks to, to these contributors. But that's not a loss. That's a gain. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Because that's it, it's like it's like pieces of a jigsaw. If you've only got certain pieces, you make up your mind regarding that and you come to a, a, what you think is an informed opinion until you get other pieces of the jigsaw. You go, oh, actually, no, this makes a completely different picture, which is why we should always be open mm. to hearing more. And, and that's where we're losing. And, I mean, thanks to programmes like you, we do tend to get discussions happening. I mean, sometimes it is incredibly polarised. Is it deliberately done like that, Kay, in terms of, well, no, I mean, you really are, you know, a hostage of fortune in terms of who phones up. And also mm-hmm. that's a very self-selecting bunch of people, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, that have a very strong opinion. It would be nice to get a much broader spectrum of people. But funny enough, you just saying that there was a guy the other day. It's usually a guy um, <laughs> because there's another issue. Why do more men than women phone up? You know, that's a whole different. Story. I have an answer to that. Do you? Yeah. And there was uh, some kind of survey done about, you know, job op- applications. Mm-hmm. Um, and they did a really expansive survey on how women and men differ differently from um, applying for jobs. And if there's sort of five things that you need to have for a job, mm-hmm. the woman will want to have all five things mm-hmm. before she applies. Whereas a man will see one or two things, go, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. So that's why he picks up the phone. Well, that's, I mean, yeah. (laughs) Sorry, have I missed something? (laughs) No, but there's just more confidence. There is, no, but there is more confidence. If if there's a subject. Maybe people are lonely. Don't be so judgmental. (laughs) Not being judgmental. I'm just saying that women think it through more about what they can offer before they commit to something. Whereas really? men will literally just... Really? And you're Why living are you looking from at me that, like that? Yeah, you're living from that, <laughs> that part of the Bible. This is just... It's, is it misandry? I don't know. I can't spell. It's a problem. Misandry. Oh, that's a good word, that one, isn't it? I'm going to call my next child that. <laughs> you can do misandry. an Edinburgh... Misandry, will you get in here? Ah, your tea's ready. <laughs> so what is the difference then? Because I happen to know another of the loose women. I'm relatively friendly with Ruth. And Ruth, I, I remember when we relatively first... Relatively friendly. Now, what is relatively friendly? Yeah, what friendly? does that mean? Can we just interrogate that a little bit? Maybe a lunch every four months. Oh, right, um, okay. Maybe that kind of thing. A call once every two a times call? in that form. A Ruth's call. never called me. I, I don't have your number and you shouldn't give it to me because I'm all about the voice notes. Um, all about the voice and notes. And then I like to pester her on QVC and frankly, I think she enjoys it. Because <laughs> she's always like that to Jackie, oh, that's my friend Bruce. Yeah, <laughs> He'll be lying there with his dog gutted. Um, but I, I know that I remember her saying to me that when she's in the supermarket and you see those magazines that we won't name and it's 
Eamon is furious yeah. and Ruth's appalled and it's something to do with Christmas wrapping paper and mm -hmm. all that. You know, they've said one thing and they've made a story and I remember Ruth going, oh, they've got all these photos of me squinting on the South Bank and it's, Eamon's looking at another woman and, you know, Ruth's like, oh, I don't have my contacts and I don't have my glasses. How much, because you have to give a bit of yourself, I always think, on loose women and have known... Um, some other of the contributors and hosts who were like, actually, they wanted me to give just a wee bit too much. I wasn't comfortable with it. How do you strike the balance of keeping you for you and your family and you for the folk that want to know more about you on the TV? Well, I mean, I I'm just as dull as hell, so nobody's that interested in me. So that, that's, that's my... That's absolute uh, nonsense. Is that, sorry, is that how you've lasted as long in television? I'm a way to lose my personality. I'm off. Honestly, there's a huge... A huge power in just being dull, dull and uninteresting. That, that's the way to do it. Kay Adams, um, you are an absolute riot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think, well, an advantage for me is that um, apart from a, a brief sort of flirtation elsewhere, um, I have mainly been an anchor. Uh -huh. And that does allow you to deflect. And I must say, much the annoyance of some of my fellow panellists, I mean, Carol McGiffin, I see the look in her eye, you know, when I sort of shut down a discussion and like go to the break and she is murderous in her intent. She always, <laughs> and she always like, we go to the break and I'll say, we'll see you after this. And she goes, you always get the last word. And she <laughs> bloody hates it. I say, I'm just doing my job. I'm just doing my job. Um, so that has been a benefit. But, you know, you are the person you are. I mean, Colleen, for instance, Colleen shares absolutely everything. And I mean, mm -hmm. I remember a million years ago when she shared that story that um, was it her, seven, her son's 17th birthday present was to go to Amsterdam and, and spend the night with a prostitute wow. or probably 45 minutes between half past two and quarter <laughs> to four in the afternoon. But, well, Quick in and out. Uh, and I mean, that I was I think the that's quite a long time, 45 minutes. <laughs> That was the first time I remember there was a story that just went, whoa, mm -hmm. it was huge and it was so personal. And so, you know, people had pictures, I think it was Shane or whatever. But, you know, that's just Colleen. She comes from the big Irish family. They talk about everything, nothing secret. And they're comfortable with that. I'm just much more Scottish, Presbyterian, uh -huh. don't wash your dirty linen in public, et cetera, mm. et cetera. So I think that just bleeds through to your... TV personality, because not to be too Gloria Gaynor about it, you know, I am what I am. Oh. You know, you can't take that out. No. Yeah, Colleen, I like see, I like that about myself. I wear my heart must leave. And I think part of that is I go, well, I'm if I tell everybody everything, then nobody can find anything out about me. But is there anything yeah. to find Nothing, out? Nothing. No. Because I've told everybody everything. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I knew a woman in Dundee who shall remain nameless, June Brun, and she <laughs> did the same for no her son. Who. No, no, no. We'll oh, June wouldn't mind. She's kind of with us, kind of no longer. You be cuckoo. And uh, <laughs> she sent her child to do the the do in Amsterdam. And I thought, I didn't have a problem with it necessarily. I just kind of thought, moving forward, if you're unable to procure a lady by virtue of one's wit, and you don't have the funds, if you are looking for a horizontal refreshment, would that not breed resentment? Or maybe I've looked into this too much. I don't know. I couldn't imagine my Mary, my mother Mary, going, come on now, <laughs> we need to get the big V off you. In you go, it's a pet full of bears. Well Going back to having different perspectives, that is an interesting one because, you know, obviously the Dutch view of that is that it's very permissive yeah. and, you know, it's very um, modern and progressive, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody's forced to do anything. But funny enough, I went with uh, my two girls to Amsterdam uh, before the pandemic. We had a lovely weekend, but of course they're so curious. They wanted to see the red light mm -hmm. district, which has become slightly touristy, hasn't it? So I thought, well, we'll walk through. It's dropped which, off. I've never been to Amsterdam. Do you know? Yeah. Oh, it's a lovely city, beautiful city. So we walked through this wee street and the little red lights and all the rest of it. Um, and outside one particular window, there was a sign and it was basically saying, and I can't remember the exact wording. I was going to try and get a photograph, but it was, please respect our women uh -huh. um, because they are doing a job that your wives and girlfriends at home don't want to do. Oh. So the, the suggestion that if you're looking for um, more unusual sexual activities and, you know, Senga's no up to it, mm. come here and do it with um, Patrizia, but make sure you're nice to her. Um, and I thought, 
Oh, that's fucking sick. <laughs> Do you think that they put out some kind of survey, <coughs> like Jojo and the people that phone in? Well, I wonder if asking they about what women will do and what they won't do. Because yeah, you're right. If if Senga's not really up for much, then you know a bit of missionary and you yeah. know maybe a, a dine in for two. Um, <laughs> then yes, the heart wants dine what the heart. <laughs> which you don't get alcohol with, by the way. Do you know? No, really it used to be fabulous, but no, can forget it. Wait, yeah, it's a roll still. Oh, you can, Kay. They're honking. They're really claggy, actually, and avoid the cheese red Leicester hot cross buns. That's just a, a wee bit from me. Did you me. try those cheesy hot cross buns? I did, and them. they were honking. Were they? I was so disappointed. You know I like cheese. And I was oh. awful upset because they used to do cheese and chilli ones last year. But you know what's nice if you get... How we've gone on from prosies to hot cross buns, I don't know. I've no idea. We've gone to Cuisine Corner <laughs> but over here. if you go to the normal ones, the spiced ones, and you put some Stilton on them, oh, honk wheat. Oh, dig really? in love, yeah. Well, getting back to prosies, oh, I don't yeah. know if my son visited one, but he went to Amsterdam. I don't think he did because he got the shock of his life because he phoned me almost immediately after going to see, I presume, some kind of sex show, but was astonished by the fact that ping pong balls could come out of there. <laughs> Well, I, I have seen that myself in Thailand in Papong Market. Papong? It is, <laughs> yeah, it's called Papong Market. And it, it is quite a skill, it has to be said. I would have you to know. say that's not for me, but my <laughs> mum is oh, an no, usherette is at the Dundee Whitehall Theatre and she boasts very proudly that she was once recipient of a soft kiss from one of the lady boys of Bangkok. Really? I know. Oh, I know. Oh. But I don't... Do we ask what a soft kiss yes, is? Yes, I was. I was wondering. I think it was more of a a bit of a a smooch um, on the cheek um, mm. sort of thing. I don't think Mary would have allowed full mouth to mouth contact. Right. She, All right, she, she, but it was with her mouth. It wasn't from where the ping pongs come. <laughs> Darling, she's eighty one. I would fucking hope not. <laughs> oh, that'd be funny. Here's a question, actually, in terms of television and radio mm -hmm. uh, do you do you have a preference key is there one or is it like when i MC or i do a set sometimes it's like oh i love MC, and then i don't want to do a set and then i go oh i just want to do my set don't want MC. do you have bits where you go oh i just want to do for tv i can't be bothered with radio or vice versa well i mean television is easier i mean oh. i mean that's just straight up you get looked after you get yeah. pampered you get your makeup done somebody brings you a cup of tea mm -hmm. you know so if, if you're looking for a bit of indulgence, television is your preferred option. Mm. Radio is bloody hard work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is hard work. You you have to do your homework. Um, you There's nobody, you can't palm anything off on anybody else. If everything is going tits up, there's nobody going to save you but yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there's no point in, you know, you're not going to have somebody whisper in your ear or say, well, go to this or somebody else covers up for you. You are absolutely isolated on your own eel. But it, it's very, very satisfying. Yeah. You know. Um, so it's satisfying and hard work. Television is a squish and fun. Mm. So you, you to have the mix of two is um is probably the ideal, isn't it? Taking you back down the line of your career, because um, well, the first time that I oh, came into wait. contact with you was when I lived. You never did. You never did come in contact with me. Do not let him say on any. I did come into contact with you. I could. How dare you denied my reality? I could see you, you <laughs> silly woman. So that's how I came into contact with you. But no, I used to live with a morbidly obese woman called Bella Boobtube, and we lived at one two five Bell Street, and we used to go to Club X on a Monday night back in the day for fifty pence vodka. I was always late, and do you know why? Because I always enjoyed Scottish women. Oh, which is ironic because I don't really, if you catch my drift. But I always thought that was such a great program. But the, the I remember the uh, it came to it later in life was when one of your biggest things was interviewing Margaret Thatcher, wasn't it? Yeah, but that was actually before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Scottish women, yeah. funnily enough. Uh, you've got to, the years are getting confused and um, so that was central television so that was my first job at a university so I think I was like 22 wow. um, at that point I had aspirations to be a political reporter um, but I spent quite a bit of time in Westminster decided they were all plonkers and yep. thought I'm not going to do that mm -hmm. um, but for the short time that I was going to do that I thought I've got to impress the boss how can I impress the boss I'll get an interview with the Prime Minister, who, of course, at that time was Margaret Thatcher. So I wrote off this letter, which must be incredibly childish now, if I was ever to find it, uh, and was absolutely astonished about a month later, 
I got a letter back from Sir Bernard Ingham, who oh. was her press secretary at the time. I've got it in the house somewhere, um, saying that I'd been granted an audience with <laughs> Margaret Thatcher um, at one o'clock at Downing Street on such and such a date. And I mean, oh my God, I just could not believe it. Because I just wanted to write the letter to look as if, you know, when you're young, you're in a job, you want to kind of look as if you've got initiative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at me. I'm being, yeah, being bold you're and going for the big guns. young thing, you know, with a bit of oomph. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought, oh, Jesus Christ, I'm actually going to have to do this. I was going to say, did you shit yourself and go, but I don't actually want I to speak to this totally, early woman. I totally did. I totally did. Um, and I remember we went down to, to London with a film crew and everything, because I mean, once we got the... The interview was all quite exciting. Um, it was, oh yeah, no, it was just post Falkland, I think. I'm, I've lost track of time. Anyway, so we went down, I was in a taxi. I remember going around Trafalgar Square in a taxi. And I don't know whether I did open the taxi door to be sick or I felt that I was gonna, I don't know. But I mean, oh my God, I've never been so nervous. Wow. And of course, in those days, you could actually drive up Downing Street and knock on the door. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's what we did. And, you know, so this huge big policeman standing there and I'm knocking on the door. Is Margaret in? <laughs> <laughs> I've got an appointment. She knows I'm coming. No, she's out to um, play with her friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And she answered the door. Oh. What was it the was hair the like? Thing. What? What was the hair like? Immaculate. Yeah. Yeah. Immaculate. I mean, um, I'm not... and you know the thing that she did that I always remember of all the things uh, because, of course, when I, I was going there in the taxi and in between being sick, I was being very bolshy in my head, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say the next thing and I'm going to take her to task, you know, sort of lefty student still in me. Um, and then got there, she opened the door and like, there was probably a puddle on the floor where I was <laughs> and she started um, sort of dusting down my shoulders. You know, when your granny used to say, oh, you've got this all over your shoulders. Look at that oose, get rid of that, you know. Oose. <laughs> That's a good Scottish word. I'm sure she didn't use the word oose, fluff. She probably said fluff. Oh. Anyway, so she fluffed down my shoulders and sort of sorted my collar to make sure I looked smart because my mum, you know, would want me to look yeah. smart on the television. Do you think, though, that that would be a deliberate sort of patronising exactly. putting you in your place? Exactly. So it couldn't have been her being like nice? No, like, it couldn't have been her nice. I bet you, I'm so cynical. I think that kind of... If you're meeting a journalist or whatever, oh, wow, that, that I can't from a power play. <laughs> I think you're exactly right. I didn't I think, think that at the time, Georgia, because I was just so agog. Mm -hmm. um, but I've reflected on it afterwards, and I think that's 100% what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And it was 100% effective, because I was just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, yes. yes, thank you. I was, if I had balls, she would have taken them off. Well, wow. it was funny, actually, because I'd watched a Terry Wogan clip of her being interviewed by him, and she talked about journalistic technique and how they would go up front with a load of, you know, big words and, and quick delivery in which to fox you. And he said, do you ever feel as though you have to concede um, to them the fact you're a woman? And she said, no, because I never have to concede to the fact that they're men. You know, I'm completely <laughs> tolerant of that <laughs> sort of thing. Um, and I know that she's not for everyone, and I'm not saying I was a supporter of her, particularly in Scotland, but you have to think, I mean, she was quite, not a big, it's a big deal, the right thing to say, because the funny thing is, I always look at Nicola Sturgeon, and I always think, whether you agreed with her or not, that must have been you thinking, well, if she can do that, I can do that, mm -hmm. I can do that, in my eyes, in a more humane way. But then, maybe Nicola is dusting off dandruff from, I don't know, <laughs> little journalists from Channel 5, <laughs> saying I, you can't come in here with your fusty shoulders. I remember Thatcher being voted into power, and I was at an age that I was aware enough, and also... Even as a sort of child thinking, oh, it will be nice to have a woman prime minister. Right. Because socially, social conditioning just makes you assume that somebody who was female would be maternal and comforting. And it's always struck me how she wasn't that. She mm. wasn't. There was, there was none of that. Well, there was always that comment, wasn't there, that she tried to be the best man in the cabinet, yeah. or indeed she was the best man in the cabinet. And remember spitting image at the time. Yes. Yeah. Absolute height. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, that was produced by um Central Television where mm -hmm. I worked. So I used to go and look at the puppets every day at lunchtime. They're oh. all behind the scene dock. It was fascinating. But um, you know, she had the pinstripe suit, if you remember, yeah. that was classic the cigar. cigar. And you know And then she moved into fatigues and combat gear. 
Yes, yeah, she, she. Yeah, <laughs> she was sleeping in a hammock and stuff. <laughs> that was a funny thing, actually, because, you know, so in television, you do the interview, and if it's, I think we had two cameras, actually, but to try and sort of recreate the feel of a multi-camera shoot, mm. once you've done the interview, and you both know this, I know, but then, so they move the camera to another position, and they just get you to babble nonsense while yeah. they get a shot of the back of your head. Noddies, they're called, aren't they? Noddies, that's right. And so they're doing that, and, of course, that requires you as the interviewer to ask a question which is a nonsense question, mm -hmm. and just say to the interviewee, you know, don't answer me, I'm just going to ask you these questions. And of course, I'm sitting in front of Margaret Thatcher thinking, oh, this is so embarrassing. And, and I heard myself say, so have you been on holiday recently? <laughs> oh. And she had just come back from the Falklands, and then that kind of struck me in the back of my head. Oh my Jesus Christ, she's just come back from the Falklands. Don't ask that question. So I was having this conversation with myself, and she was looking at me thinking, you're just a lightweight a complete lightweight but you know it's funny you talk about that she was very maternal was she? she was in that setting with me mm. she was very maternal you know uh, she showed me round downing street she showed me the view um of horse guards parade out the back and um, she was kind to me and in mm -hmm. some of her small talk i thought god this is funny this is a kind woman but obviously her politics mm. seemed to so many people and, you know, arguably was incredibly harsh. And, cruel. and I kind of thought of her as one of those nannies knows best people. Mm -hmm. You know, I know what's good for you. And she genuinely believed in her head that she knew what was mm -hmm. good for people. It is that, that's yeah, a really good description, isn't it? Sort of, you know, I know this medicine tastes awful, darling, but it is very good for you. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's good for you to be in bed at half past six because you'll get a good night's sleep. sleep and, you know, your brain will get time to recuperate and you'll be up with them, blah, 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 blah. Um, and she was kind of uncompromising in that. But I don't you... necessarily think that she came from a, a malicious place. Mm -hmm. But you're right, Bruce, and I do think it is a bit of a shame that in Scotland, obviously, politically, there's a very strong mm -hmm. negative view of Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. And whilst I wouldn't disagree with that, mm -hmm. it shouldn't preclude us from having a wider conversation about her because it was a big deal to be the first female prime yeah. minister. But but that's the whole thing. I, I remember watching the documentary when she died and I'm not here to tell people how they feel. And, you know, she obliterated some people's livelihoods, lives, all that kind of stuff, of course. But it was these children um, who were obviously either the grandchildren of the people that suffered under her regime, passionately singing Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead. And you're like, but you never met her, so you've only... And that's when... Learned I behaviour. But that's when I tip into, over. you know, will we ever eradicate racism, misogyny, mm -hmm. misandry, or whatever, because of European and, you know, your teaching, if you see what mm -hmm. I mean, that that kind of thing. Can I ask Kay, and this is maybe mm -hmm. a... Wee... All right, is it so what, this half hour has been a prelude to the big question, has it? <laughs> yes, I know you're not married, so shall we? Um, no, what I was going to say was... With, I know that Ruth's turned 60, Lorraine's turned 60, I'm about to turn 60. Do you think it's encouraging that we have many more women over and above the age of 45 on TV? Um, yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. And funny enough, I'm starting a new podcast about how to be 60. Um, so nice. you've, uh, a podcast, Kay? I wonder where you got yes. the idea for that. That's that's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's a scary number, isn't it? Did, have you reached it yet, Kay? No, I haven't. Right, I'm four years off. I'm going to be 56 this year. I'm, yeah. I'm 13 yeah. stone. <laughs> I don't even like saying the number. I mean, it's it's just such a scary Were you number. okay turning 50? Pardon? Were you okay turning 50? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, really, I have ignored all birthdays from 31. <clears throat> um, I just haven't acknowledged them. I never, like... Ian, my partner, he's one for a big party. Oof. He had a big party for his 50th. Uh -huh. um, and bless him, the poor sod, he organised a surprise birthday party for me, mm. which I kind of knew was happening because I had, you know, the kids, you know, when you've got kids, there's no surprise. No, absolutely. And they just couldn't, they couldn't keep it in. But so I kind of knew it was happening. And I really, and I did say to them, look, um, tell dad, tell dad, I don't really, I'm not that keen, but oh, I knew it was happening. Yeah. Uh, and so I came home from London, actually, and I just knew that I was going to open the door surprise. and they were going to pretend it's normal and then they would open the door of the living room and it would be surprise! And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I had a real difficulty keeping a smile on my face <laughs> and looking as if I was happy because inside I was thinking, fuck off! 
It does, it's that thing though, isn't it? You feel like you're so ungrateful, but equally it is just get fuck off. I know, Leave me alone. I know I'd happily go out for a quiet meal, just mm. to tell me whatever. But I just I didn't feel like celebrating, no. you know. Um and to have to spend like four hours that you know, that smile, you know, that smile, you just sort of like, uh uh-huh, yeah, yeah, it's lovely, it's nice. And rah, 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 rah. Um <laughs> but anyway, back to the question, Bruce. Of course it's of course it is a good thing. Um yeah. Um, because we always say this about comedians as well. Okay, you have brilliant comedians of any ages, but if you look laterally at the, the drive and the career of someone like Joan Rivers at her age and the passion that she had, and, and also as well, and it happens with males, is you, you've lived a life, you have more experience, you know, you're not telling tales as a 23 year old white middle class male from I don't know the west end of Glasgow and how hellish it is living in your parents' house while they have a conservatory put in. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Joan Rivers or Billy Connolly mm-hmm. or you know any number of other people that we could quote or mm-hmm. who are like 60 plus uh, poor Joan is no longer with us she was one of my great favourites mm-hmm. but I mean we're super 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 cool people mm-hmm. you know and we're always super cool weren't they were you there the day that jo- uh, Joan swore and was no, taken off? Oh, oh my God, on those women. Oh, I love that. I, honestly. They get the F word and they basically put the shepherd's crook round her. Yeah. Oh, really? Because she went, get ready to bleep this. And she was asked about Russell Crowe and she said, he's an F in piece of SH1T. <laughs> and then it was funny, she was interviewed after they went, how do, would you go back on the show, Joan? She went, if they buy me a present. Oh. She went, but let me tell you, there was nothing loose about those women. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um. Quickly going back to the Margaret Thatcher interview and how it went out. Were you happy with it or were you embarrassed by it? And on the basis of that, do you have anything in your career that you look back on and it just makes like I do when I think about when I was on your show? Do you, anything that makes you go, oh my god, I'm I just never want to remember that? Cringe. Um. Well, it was um. It was probably that one to be honest. It was a dreadful interview. Um, I was just too young, too inexperienced. She completely dominated it. Mm-hmm. In fact, all the way through it, and we're going back to the days of film, so it wasn't even filmed on like a digital format, it was film. And uh, I just agree, I just sort of, she, I would ask her a question. I think I asked four questions in the entire interview. She just kept talking. Mm-hmm. And all you could hear from my microphone was, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know just that sort of nervous sort of thing and the editor a guy called Ian Wilkinson I've always be grateful to him went through spent all night just slicing out with a tiny scalpel wow. as many of my <laughs> as he possibly could or else I would have just been toast I feel that these noises are bringing us back to the old streets of Amsterdam <laughs> <day. I'm, laughs> and I feel that's possibly where we shall leave it today <laughs> <laughs> can we genuinely simulated sex noises is that what you've just accused Kay Adams of really was... <laughs> look at that at my age but that's the thing at your age of course you're super sexy 60s well she said she was going to call her next child mis- misandry so oh. there's, there's medical help everywhere absolutely either that if I have twins it'll be chlamydia and clitoria oh nice <laughs> and are they taking your name or Ian's <laughs> Ian's Ian's absolutely <laughs> he got you into this mess. Uh, Kay, thank you so much. And again, thanks for all the retweets and stuff. It's been really nice talking oh, to you. Oh, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you so Honestly. much. Oh, well, you have been honest, Kay. You have. <laughs> you have. That's what we love. It is. It's the beauty. And thank you so much for listening to us. We try. We do. We are. We are very honest with each other and we enjoy it. I think you have to be. Yeah. Okay, then. Are. Godspeed. I look forward to even more. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Kay. Toodles. Yeah, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.